Hello to all of you and a very warm welcome for this um, seminar on women's empowerment and a special look and celebration at a tool that has helped us to advance empowerment and will continue to do so. This policy seminar is organized by IFPRI uh, together with USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. My name is Charlotte Hebebrand. I am the Director of Communication and Public Affairs at IFPRI. We're very eager to hear from all of you throughout this seminar. Please do participate in our Q&A session, which will follow the presenter's remarks, and you can submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. It's now my distinct pleasure to turn the floor over to Yo Swinnen, who is the Director General of IFPRI, as well as the Global Director of the Systems Transformation Science Group within the CGIR. Thanks for being with us, Yo. Thanks very much, Charlotte. And uh, as Charlotte, uh, I am delighted to welcome everybody to this special event, this anniversary, uh, marking a decade of the Women's Empowerment and Agricultural Index, or the WAI, as it is often referred to. I would like to start by congratulating everybody who's been involved in this project, my, especially my colleagues at IFPRI who've invested so much time and energy in this. And certainly also our partners such as USAID, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and many other organizations and researchers who have made uh, major contributions. Uh, I'm delighted that Jim Barnard is here with me introducing the session and that several representatives of these organizations are on the panel uh, today. The way I is now utilized by over 230 organizations around the world, and needless to say, IFPRI is very proud to have been part of this uh, project. We know that globally women are key actors in every part of the food systems. They make crucial contributions as farmers, as processors, as traders, as consumers. And we know that their work is often undervalued, underpaid, and overlooked. The unequal distribution of rights, resources, responsibilities between men and women in food systems often make women and girls more vulnerable to malnutrition, to poor health, and to excessive workloads. These inequities have been informed by COVID-19, where we know that COVID-19 has reinforced inequalities in the world, and particularly hurt women, children, and the poor. As we build back after the pandemic and continue to transform our food systems, gender equality must be at the center of what we do, of what we propose. Gender equality is, is a crucial factor for innovation, for healthy and for inclusive food systems. We know from research that women's agency can lead to increased agricultural productivity, that it's often a factor, an important factor in adoption of uh, better technologies, of smarter practices, for example, climate smart uh, innovations. Women are often also the stewards of good nutrition within the households, promoting healthy diets for uh, themselves and for their families. To achieve more gender equality and to monitor uh, women's empowerment, we need accurate and effective tools. We are needed, they allow to monitor progress towards equity goals, they to hold stakeholders accountable, and also to identify solutions which may have, or which we hope to have significant impacts. And this is really what the Women's Empowerment and Agricultural Index set out to do. It's an innovative and a holistic approach to measure empowerment. As our speakers no doubt will uh, describe in detail, this index captures key economic and social determinants of women's agency at the household level. It captures the empowerment of both women and men, and so allows to measure gender equality. The index, is, the index is adaptable. It's adaptable across different contexts, and to date it has been used in uh, over 58 countries, so that's a major achievement, I think. It has allowed to shape policy and to promote meaningful action around the world in many countries. It is also a dynamic process. New and adapted versions of the WEA are still being developed to address gender issues in a variety of contexts. For example, right now, the project level WEA has been developed and is specially designed to monitor women's empowerment in various types of agricultural development projects. While over its first decade, the index has been a critical tool for catalyzing, uh, catalyzing change. There is still much to be done. We know from the general developments in the world that, and particularly also now with uh, climate change and the ongoing pandemic, that it has negatively affected women's empowerment and, has, and these shocks are often um, disproportionately affecting women. 
Okay, so therefore, a lot is to be done. A lot of work is ahead of us. A lot of research is ahead of us as well. And so, IFPRI is excited to continue our work with the way I and building more inclusive and equitable food systems as a result of it. We have a great lineup of speakers and uh, the own, uh, and basically the speakers, the introductory speakers, and the panel discussion. So I'm going to give the floor to them. I really look forward to their contributions and to the discussion. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Yo. Um, you referred already to a number of positive outcomes uh, that, that result from enhanced agency of women in the agricultural sector. So we're gonna pull up a quick poll for all of you to participate in. If you would give us a one word answer to what do you believe will be positively impacted by enhanced women's empowerment agency and inclusion in the agricultural sector. And we'll come back to the results of that poll uh, a little bit later on in today's program. Uh, as, as Yo mentioned, we are very pleased to have with us Jim Barnhart. Uh, Jim is the Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future, as well as the Assistant to the Administrator in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at uh, USAID. Uh, Jim, the original WEA idea actually came from USAID, I understand, because um, the agency was looking for a women's empowerment metric for the Feed, Feed the Future initiative. So thanks very much for being with us and telling us a little bit the, the background of, of that great uh, thinking on, on uh, behalf of USAID. No, thank you, Charlotte, and um, it, it's wonderful to be here. I enjoyed um, you all hearing your, your thoughts and Charlotte, that's a very good, a very smart move to um, to tease the the releasing the poll data later, right? That keeps your audience there on the edge of their seats. So I'm I'm actually very excited to be here with you guys, uh, with the whole team here to celebrate the 10 years of, of the WIA. You know, over a decade ago, the at the start of Feed the Future, the evidence was clear that although women around the world played a critical role in agriculture growth they faced persistent barriers, um, social and economic. And those barriers limited the participation in the sector. So in response, the Feed the Future initiative and its partners recognized that to be intentional about how we included women in agriculture, we needed a way to measure success. And we needed to better understand the social, economic and policy factors that might affect empowerment. And that's how the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, or, or as we lovingly call it, the WIA, you know, it was started, you know, as an innovative tool to, to comprehensively measure women's empowerment in agriculture, capturing everything from decision making to access to credit to, to women's workload. And those early discussions at the start of Feed the Future took place with partners, uh, many of whom you'll hear from today. And back then, we never anticipated how many organizations and, and partner governments would start to use WIA-based metrics to hold themselves accountable to advancing women's empowerment and gender equity in food systems. You know, since its launch 10 years ago, 230 organizations across 58 countries have used WIA metrics to track progress toward women's empowerment and, and gender equality. WIA data enab enabled us to, to learn a, a lot about roadblocks to empowerment in the areas where we concentrated in programming. You know, some of the biggest roadblocks were a lack of access to credit and agency to make credit related decisions. You know, on average, women were twice as disempowered as men in their ability to access and make decisions regarding credit. Feed the Future programs, including in Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Nepal, Uganda, and Kenya, have used WIA to identify areas in which women and men are disempowered so that our programs and policies can be targeted to those areas. The governments of Bangladesh and Ethiopia are using the WIA findings to inform their national agriculture and nutrition programs. These results result, these efforts resulted in positive outcomes for women's empowerment in agriculture at the end of the first phase of Feed the Future. But for example, through targeted programming and, and partnerships, we measured a 31% increase in women's empowerment in agriculture in Bangladesh, and nearly a 20% increase in Nepal. So, but despite these gains, we find ourselves facing new challenges. COVID-19 threatens to undermine years of development progress to reduce hunger and malnutrition. And the climate crisis poses 
an existential threat to partner countries and threatens agriculture productivity. Globally, rural households were hit hard by COVID-19 and experienced large income losses. Women's workloads and care time increased and their assets like land and livestock were often depleted. Now we know that, multi the, that the multiple roles women and girls play, such as producing food, generating income and providing care, place them at a critical nexus in food security, resilience and nutrition. So as we look to the next phase of Feed the Future, Inclusive led agriculture is at the heart of our approach. Our newly adapted um, and enhanced global food security strategy, which guides our efforts, recognizes that empowering women and girls in all their diversity, as well as the recognition and respect of their rights is critical to achieving secure, sustainable and equitable food systems. 10 years after the launch of WIA, tracking empowerment such as assets, agency, and time use are more critical than ever. So I, I wanna encourage us to build on that WIA framework and tools and think about how to measure women's empowerment in different segments of the food system beyond the household to allow us to better inform policies and programs. Finally, we must advance global partnerships to improve the availability and access to gender data recognizing the importance for designing inclusive and equitable policies and programs to advance women's empowerment and gender equality worldwide. So I look forward to today's panel discussion on what we've learned from we over the last decade. Thank you all for joining us and, and back to you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Jim. Both you and Yo really spoke about the importance of this tool for tracking and monitoring women's empowerment, and also importantly, the impact that it can have on policies uh, around the world. So thank you very much for those comments. Let's get ready now to pull up the answers to our earlier question. Um, and I will tee up our next speaker. We're really excited that Agnes Quisenbung, uh, who's a senior research fellow at IFPRI, will speak to us about the evolution of WEA and the evidence that it has generated over the past 10 years. And let me just make a quick uh, uh, reference here to some of the uh, key principal investigators on the, on the IFPRI side that really had such an important role in launching WEA. And of course it was Agnes, it was also Ruth, who come later on in the program, and as well as uh, Amber Peterman, now with uh, UNC, and Greg Seymour, who was back then a dissertation student at AU, but is now at IFPRI. And then Hazel Malapit, another very important person with regard to the WEA, came after WEA was launched, but has played a key role in helping us to take it forward. So here are your answers to that question. Um, the biggest one, interestingly enough, uh, is nutrition. Uh, increased income and decision making, um, and lots of other answers here. Uh, so thank you very much for all your contributions to this. I think this is a great list. I also know that some of you have a clear question, so we'll improve that in the future. Uh, yes. Okay, am I on? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for saying what you think will be impacted by women's empowerment. So good day, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index with all of you. And like big parties, I'd like to mention um, other people who were there with us at the start, um, Sabina Alkar and Anna Vash from the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Sabina will be speaking later on. And our fairy godmothers from USAID, Karen Groen and Emily Hogue. So next slide, please. So let's look back to the beginning. The way it was developed by USAID, IFPRI and OFI in 2012 to measure women's inclusion in the agricultural sector. USAID basically was the matchmaker of IFPRI and OFI to get us to work together on this. It was different from other indices because it was based on interviewing both men and women in the same household. It was designed to look at sole or joint decision-making and control over livelihoods, resources and income, mostly in agriculture and in population-based surveys. It drew very heavily on Naila Kabir's definition of empowerment as 
expanding people's ability to make strategic life choices, particularly in contexts where they had been denied this ability. And in her definition, this ability to, to exercise choice encompasses the three dimensions of resources, agency, and achievements. Because resources and, and achievements tend to be better measured using other instruments, so the way of focuses on the agency aspect, where tools to develop agency hadn't really been well developed. So next slide, please. The construction of the way draws a lot from the expertise in OFI um, in constructing multidimensional indices. So this is part of the Alcair Foster family of indices. Um, it's made up of two, and this is the five domains of empowerment and the gender parity index. These five domains are production, resources, income, leadership in the community and time. And the GPI examines a woman's empowerment relative to the man in the same household. So the way is a measure of both empowerment and gender equality. Next slide, please. So where was rolled out to the 19 feet of future countries. It was a long instrument and users wanted a shorter version. So we delivered on that by coming up with the abbreviated WEA or AWEA, which had the same five domains, but went from 10 indicators to six indicators. Uh, next slide, please. And as more people started using the WEA, agricultural development projects wanted to tweak it. They wanted to make sure that they could measure the impact of their project on women's empowerment, but the existing indicators didn't really quite cut it for them. They wanted to include aspects of women's empowerment that they thought were important to project success. And this meant listening to men's and women's own voices, drawing on qualitative research. So in developing ProWEA, we use qualitative methods to test and triangulate the quantitative instruments. Um, a lot of people think that because ProWEA has a quantitative survey, it doesn't pay attention to qualitative, qualitative methods. That is really completely wrong. The qualitative methods were really important to test and triangulate the quantitative instruments. And there is, in fact, a set of qualitative protocols that accompanies the ProWEA. We develop optional ads on for nutrition and livestock oriented projects, and also a version for focusing on market inclusion, not just production. So it isn't true, as others may have said, that where only looks at production, we can look at all stages of the value chain. Um, what's a bit different in the structure of ProWEA is that it has three domains of agency, intrinsic agency, instrumental agency, and collective agency, or power within, power to, and power with using the Roland's definition. Next slide, please. So the way uh, evolution goes from WEA to AWEA to ProWEA and its variants. So you can see that there's core ProWEA and there are a variety of add-on modules. There's also the IWEA, the integrated WEA, which IFAD adopted. And what it did was to integrate WEA questions into existing large-scale surveys, and then it this ends up shorten, shortening um, interview time. So the EFAD work also develop, ends up developing new measures of time use agency and collective agency. Now, in the right-hand corner, you'll see um, this intriguing logo for the Women's Empowerment Metric for National Statistical Systems, or WOMENS. This is still under development. We're taking the lessons learned from WEA to develop this. I'll talk about this in greater detail later. Next slide, please. We have a very active capacity building effort to grow the WEA community of practice. Um, we did our trainings in person before, but as you know, because of the pandemic, we've all had to go virtual. And so if we now do virtual training and we've launched a distance learning program that Ruth will talk about later. Next slide, please. So let's say in the next series of slides, we're going to see where WEA has gone all over the world. We started with three pilot countries in 2011, Bangladesh, Guatemala, and Uganda, and four organizations using the WEA. Next slide, please. We officially launched the WEA in 2012, and the US Feed the Future initiative used it in its baseline population-based surveys. What's really important about this, as you'll see from the graph on the right, is that it, this gave us the first ever picture of the extent of women's disempowerment across countries using a common measure. So if you look at the graph on the right, the longest arm there or the longest bar is the biggest extent of this empowerment and this belonged to Bangladesh. This was very important 
it spurred the Bangladesh government to action, as you will see in a bit. Next slide, please. In 2015, we launched the abbreviated WEA. By then, 26 countries and 41 organizations were using it. Next slide, please. In 2016, um, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, and the CGI Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, 13 agricultural development projects got together in GAP2, the Gender Agriculture and Assets Project Phase 2, to develop the Project Level WEA, or Pro WEA as a response to the need for better metrics at the project level. That same year, the government of Bangladesh launched the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Gender Linkages Project, or ANGEL, based on the findings mentioned earlier, and you will hear more about this in a bit. Next slide, please. In 2017, we started developing an instrument that could measure women's empowerment in value chains. We call this WEA for VC, WEA for Value Chains, with pilots in Bangladesh in the Philippines. Next slide. And in 2018, we did a soft launch of the pro WEA in Rome and in Washington, DC. By then, um, many of our 13 projects had already used pro WEA in their baseline surveys. Um, next slide. In 2019, we piloted the pro WEA for market inclusion, which is the new name of WEA for VC in Benin and Malawi. And next slide, please. And we all know what happened in 2020. We got grounded. So we had efforts to develop the women's empowerment in, for national statistical systems. We had planned to go to the field. We planned to do stakeholder consultations on the ground. Well, we took everything virtual like everything else in the world. Next slide, please. In 2021, we started phone surveys in Bangladesh, Malawi, and Nepal to pilot questions for women's. And next slide. And here we are, it's 2022, WEA or its variants have been used in 58 countries and 232 organizations. Happy birthday, WEA, you're 10 years old. Okay, next slide. So if you look at the, or, all the organizations that have adopted WEA since its beginning, this has really taken off since 2014. What have we learned from this? Next slide. Okay, just click through, please. We've seen where I use in a variety of contexts. Please continue clicking. Okay, one more. And what have we learned from all of this? Next slide, please. We've learned that it's important to, le to listen to people. We need to hear how people understand and experience empowerment. Context is important on its own and to, and to interpret quantitative findings. And this is why we have used mixed methods approaches from the beginning of WEA. The original WEA drew on life histories and case studies. Pro WEA has qualitative protocols that inform the choice of indicators and interpretation of results. Um, by the way, both the qualitative and the quantitative protocols are downloadable from the WEA Resource Center. Next slide. And now that we have an internationally validated measure of women's empowerment, it was possible to examine relationships between women's empowerment and other development outcomes. For example, we learned that it's positively associated with agricultural productivity and dietary diversity in Bangladesh, with women's iron status in India, and adoption of new technologies in Kenya. There are many studies that are ongoing. Next slide. But we also found out that trade-offs exist. Women's empowerment doesn't always benefit the woman herself. Using data from six countries, Bangladesh, Nepal, Cambodia, Ghana, Mozambique, and Tanzania, we found out that women's empowerment was positively associated only with children's long-term nutritional status, measured using the height for age Z score. We found that greater equality within the household was associated with a higher likelihood of exclusive breastfeeding and better children's long-term nutritional status, again, using height for age Z score but lower women's body mass index or BMI. And these are in populations that do have low BMI. So we're not concerned too much about overweight and obesity in, in, this, in this particular group of women. And packing these results suggest trade-offs with women's time use and own nutritional status. What we find is women who are more involved in agriculture have a higher workload and because they're working more, they tend to have a lower BMI. Next slide, please. 
So recall that we worked with GAP, in GAP2 with 13 agricultural development projects to develop PROWEA and use it in impact evaluations. So the, this project strategies really work to empower women. What we found that even with empowerment objectives, many agricultural development did not achieve significant impacts on empowerment indicators. What we found is that it's hard. Empowering women is hard. You're going against a lot of very entrenched barriers and gender norms. There is, however, some correspondence between the types of strategies that have impact and the indicators of agency, but it's not exact. So for example, strategies that increase respect within the household for women and achieving work balance for both men and women may be effective. Group-based strategies have been great for women, but they may also end up reducing men's participation in groups. We find that there are quite large differences between the South Asian and Africa projects within the portfolio. Next slide, please. We've also learned that projects can be successful and what's key to these successful projects. They are intentional. They have very deliberate strategies. Um, they try to address underlying gender norms. They often work through women's groups and very importantly involve men and influential household and community members as part of the solution. Next slide, please. Lessons learned from the way are also informing our work with the 50 by 2030 initiative, the World Bank LSMS and Emory University to develop a leaner instrument for use in nationally representative surveys. This, is a, this will enable us to link women's empowerment to different types of data and offers the ability to answer questions on a nationally representative scale. In developing questions for women, we mapped the SDG5, Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, and other relevant SDGs as a guide to coming up with questions. So this is work in progress. We completed a first round of stakeholder consultations. We piloted a first round of phone surveys and are about to launch a second round. Um, if all goes well, we'll be launching face-to-face -face service this year and the new tool next year in 2023. Women's is building on lessons from WEA, but we suspect it will look very different. Next slide and last slide. Um, you've seen the map of WEA. Now let's listen to the voices of our WEA users from all over the world. Providing evidence, solid evidence, is very important for including women's empowerment and gender issues in policies. When this WEA uh, Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index was developed in 2012. At that time, we also started designing our National Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey. My colleague Agnes said that, Akhtar, how about including this uh, WIA module in your national survey? Because this is the first national representative survey where WIA could be included. And then, when we analyzed the data, we found that women's empowerment proves nutrition for women, for children in the household. We also found that women's empowerment improves agricultural diversity and women's empowerment helps people move out of poverty. So these are solid examples uh, because we have this uh, women's empowerment in agriculture index. So with that uh, evidence, then we uh, went to the Minister of Agriculture and then we designed this ANGEL project. So after uh, completing the research, we found some uh, quite uh, useful, interesting findings about uh, uh, this, this, this ANGEL pro uh, program. It improved uh, you know, nutrition knowledge and agriculture production practices improved and farmers income improved and uh, empowerment of both men and women improved in various areas. So encouraged by these results, then the ministry have decided to scale up the ANGEL program nationally. So this is unprecedented in Bangladesh. As a project implementation agency, what is important for us is that we, it relates to the theory of change that we articulate of, you know, shifting the power balance and that brings about empowerment. And I think what is also very significant for us is that uh, when you when you are in a project, there are many things to be done. But the indices are mapped in such a way that it tells you exactly what are the, you know, the key points that should be hitting. 
So for example, the group membership. So that has a very high weightage. And for us in a theory of change, that is a precursor to everything. As a program team, it helped us to you know, pick up what were the lacunas in our program and address those specific to those issues of mobility or whether it's group membership or whether it's control over income. So these are things which were very important and the ProVea picked those up and you know, fed it back to the implementation team. Besides working on the way at the time it was being crafted, I have had the opportunity to work with this uh, tool in practice. I've worked on a, a survey involving 1,400 smallholder farmers. I find the way a very creative research tool and it interrogates aspects of empowerment that are rarely measured by other tools. For example, time use, time allocation model is a very, very creative tool and it really sheds light on an aspect of empowerment that is hardly measured in many studies. So we, we've changed the way we train, we've changed the way we pay attention to the manner in which we ask the questions, the way we wait for responses, or the way we engage uh, with the respondents as they are giving us the answers. I find that aspect of the way are very creative and very innovative. I have been using the Women Empowerment in Agriculture Index on several occasions, but probably the most interesting one have been using it for the baselines and end lines of the joint program on rural women economic empowerment in Niger. Guatemala, Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan and Nepal. But we are also using it to shape up the second phase of the program, understanding what are the interventions and the methodologies that are more effective in boosting women's empowerment. We found that um, workloads are, for instance, a key determinant of disempowerment across all the countries of implementation. Another interesting finding relates to the use of gender transformative methodologies such as GALS, the Gender Action Learning System, which when used had major effects on empowerment uh, of women in a number of empowerment domains and in particular on intrinsic empowerment. We have used the Project Level Women's Empowerment Agricultural Index or the ProWEA in Burkina Faso, Ghana in India. What we have learned from using the ProWEA is really understanding the impact that our interventions can have on other household members. For example, in Burkina Faso, men were more financially excluded than women, which goes against the general and international statistics that suggest that women are more financially excluded. While this can have positive impacts for women where they have increased decision making around financial instruments used at the household level, it can also have unintended negative consequences when men are using and leveraging their women, their wives' access to financial services, possibly over indebting women on behalf of the household. This has really encouraged us to think more about how we engage men in the interventions, particularly when we are targeting women for women's economic empowerment um, activities. I think we are lucky that in Bangladesh, all variants of UIA have been tested and implemented. Finding of UIA results from Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey used to design another study called Agriculture Nutrition Gender Study, Gender Linkage Project. The findings of that survey is taken by government, implemented by Agriculture Ministry, and they're using the findings from Angel uh, survey and gradually is fading up with the best practi practices to implement the same thing in hundreds of upazilas. So now we will be looking uh, forward to see the next decade how this uh, we, uh, modules index uh, help to shape further researches in coming years. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Agnes, for uh, walking us through that impressive timeline and, and a great video showing uh, some of the testimonials from the users of, uh, of the WEA. 
We're now moving into the panel discussion of, of this event. And before we do, let me remind you that we're very keen to hear from all of you. Please do participate in our Q&A session, which will start right after this next panel. You can submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. So we're going to kick off with Karen uh, Grone. She is the Senior Technical Advisor for Fiscal Policy, as well as the former Global Director for Gender uh, at the Gender um, World Bank Group. She has been called, uh, Agnes referred to you earlier, Karen, as the brains at USAID at the time on, on WEA. So my first question to you is um, pertains to that time. Uh, Tell us what it was like uh, to, to be one of the brains and what insights do you have from that experience? And then in a second uh, follow-on question, let's move to your role at the World Bank. Could you talk about some of the World Bank projects that have used or are using any variant of the WEA and uh, insights that that has uh, provided over, over the years? Over to you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. And thank you to IFPRI. I cannot believe that it has been 10 years I never in my wildest dreams thought that the WEA would have had the success, the reach, the influence that it has, it has had. 58 countries and 232 organizations, that is a wow. And I have to say since that time, measuring women's empowerment has become a cottage industry. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, at the end but I wanna give huge compliments to IFPRI, the entire team that you all uh, mentioned. And a side note for me, several of them are my PhD students. Uh, so I'm really pleased that they could be part of the, um, the growth of this cottage industry. Uh, back at AID, I, I wanted to uh, highlight the role of Emily Hoke. She was, uh, I was the senior gender advisor at USAID and Emily, was with Feed the Future and she came to me and she said, we are standing up a monitoring framework and um, we need to really think about women, how we engage women in agriculture. Uh, and they had some ideas which I didn't find were particularly robust, but we started to play around with the idea of measuring women's empowerment. And in addition to Nyla Kabir's work, which was very influential for me, I also was thinking about work in economics that came from uh, economic theory and bargaining models and what gives women agency and empowerment. So it was sort of a combination of NILA and bargaining models that we thought were really important. And we convened uh, uh, IFPRI to, because of their stellar work on women in agriculture over all the years as well as uh, Sabina, who you'll hear from next, uh, Sabina Alkair at OPI, because we had been really impressed with the methodology that they used for multidimensional empowerment. And we thought maybe there might be a marriage. We didn't know if a marriage match would work, but uh, I think you've seen the results. It has worked of um, some really great theory, methodology, uh, fantastic organizations. So, um, as a result of these early conversations, there were some things that emerged that I just want to highlight that I think are really important. The first is this was about agriculture. We actually did get some early criticism about the fact that it was agricultural oriented and why wasn't it a broader measure of empowerment? So why didn't we include things like gender-based violence as a constraint to women's agency? And at that time, I don't think we really had the tools to do that. I think we understand a lot more now about how GBV can be measured and how it is a tool to agency. But we were quite determined to keep it focused on, on agriculture. The second thing that I really loved about the WIA, and it came out early in the conversations, was the, the fact that we needed to do cognitive testing. We needed to make sure people understood the way the questions were being asked. We needed to understand how to interpret their answers. And that was really fantastic that they were, we were able to do some cognitive testing in places like Haiti and elsewhere. Elsewhere, The other thing that I thought was really brilliant about the WIA was that um, I, I knew that time use was a dimension, but we didn't really know, and we didn't have a technology for measuring time use in a big survey. Um, previous efforts had been standalone and very long. And the fact that we did this abbreviated time use module that was really piloted in Bangladesh and showed how to do it, I think was uh, terrifically influential. 
Um, the fact that it measures women relative to men. A lot of people use uh, WIA for women's empowerment, but for me, the most important thing is the gap. Women relative to men. It focuses on the gap and it focuses on the level. And I have to say by going in the household uh, to get information on women versus men, critical. And that's still a struggle in, in household surveys. We, do, we need to do much more about going into the household. And I love the fact that WIA has been adaptable and flexible over the years, and there's three variants. So unlike back in 2013, when we tried to convince the World Bank and the LSMS team to use the WEA, they weren't very receptive then, I'm really pleased to note that the World Bank has started to adopt this terrific methodology. We started in a few places in Nepal with the abbreviated WIA, um, but we didn't, and in, we explored it in other contexts like Nigeria, but we didn't get very much traction. But the third variant, the pro WIA, has been the right instrument that the bank can use. And we're now using it in a project in Iraq, which is a very interesting context. We're using it in a project in Honduras and a project in Guatemala. And I have to say, we have this as a result of government requests who have, must have heard about the WEA from other countries where they're really interested in how to reach more women, whether it's with extension services or technology or other things. So I'm really thrilled that we have some projects that we're going to learn from, but there's some lessons. The funding is still a constraint, and I would be interested in thinking through how we can make this much more uh, regular. And finally, let me just conclude with the, I, the comment that I mentioned this has become a cottage industry. I really like the way that this is evolving and measuring women's empowerment. But I want to end with a cautionary note that the thing for me that's most important is while I care about a lot of the psychological features of WEA, as a policymaker, it's really important to me to figure out where I can intervene, particularly for the enabling environment. I'm not sure how much I can do on the psychological front, but I know I can do much more on the enabling environment and the economic front. Thank you and compliments again. Thank you very much, Karen. Great, great uh, remarks. Sabina Alkire is the director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, known as OFI, and she is another brain of the WEA um, at, at OFI, and I believe others were also involved. Uh, maybe I'll let you mention them, Sabina. There's lots of brains behind this great tool. Over to you. I, let, sorry, let me ask you the question. Um, in addition to the WEA, you and your OFI colleagues have developed the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, uh, the MPI, which is very widely used and adopted. What have you learned from these experiences about what it takes for a measure to be widely adopted and used by policymakers worldwide? Thank you very much, Sabina. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And really a heartfelt congratulations to all of the people in all of the institutions whether it be in the field, whether it be in the office, in the fundraising or the technical part who have worked steadily through time to continue and to evolve WEA and so that it can meet the needs in so many different places. It's really been a joy to hear Agnes's presentation. And I also want to recognize the work of Dr. Anavaj in OFI and now Sophia um, in this work. So the work of WEA and the work on multidimensional poverty have in common that there's a technical geek core, whether it's qual or quant. And the seven notes that I have that might be in common spell ties up, ties sup, um, to have a, a community of dimensions. The first is that the technical rigor has been maintained in WEA and it's been vital for us um, while you innovate. So we've innovated the global MPI, national specifications, a business MPI, a child MPI that's linked not so you don't create confusion or linked gender and intra-household technologies. Um, but similarly, the way it has evolved. And as it evolves, you have made your codes and methodologies open source as we do. And we all to teach this work enthusiastically so that other hands, minds, and voices can learn the techniques for free. The second is re involving research users. So we want to make sure that a non-technical policymaker can confidently interpret and use the information platform linked to a multidimensional poverty measure because clarity releases creativity and clarity is built by graphics 
by presentations, by one-to-one -one conversations and relationships, but that involvement of people who can do what we cannot do in policy and action is, is key. And key at the other side and of equal importance is what Wea has done exceedingly well, which is to continue to engage the protagonists, disempowered women or poor people in communities. So that the metrics match their needs, but also because they are the protagonists and their actions are required to bring change. And so seeing them and their agency as a pillar and centerpiece of the work and finding better ways to engage them so that people who do surveys don't run away with data, but share it back, I think is a vital thing and perhaps something all of us can learn to do better. Um, another characteristic has been stories. Um, basically learning how, as you have learned from different organizations and countries, so we have learned how to use a multidimensional poverty measure to monitor change um, for budgeting, for targeting households, for targeting particular population groups, for coordinating across different ministries or designing integrated policies. Um, and how do different levels of government from the national to the local work together? on a common priority. So learning these experiences and, and documenting them technically, but now also procedurally, so that others can get inspired by the pioneers of this work in a different country and context and figure out how to do it on their own side. Another characteristic is perhaps boring, but I'm sure in this community real, which is data. And two comments on the data. First, the surveys. The Women's Empowerment in Agriculture survey was innovative. Measuring empowerment requires innovation, but indicators are hard to improve. And in our case, in OFI, we have found that despite very serious and careful efforts, we have been powerless to change the surveys of international organizations. And so we just have to go with indicators we know to be suboptimal. And even enumerators or others might go with what's familiar. So I think the WEMS. Uh, the work for national statistics organizations that Agnes mentioned is vital. But also vital is to keep the data fresh, to update regularly, because it revs up the interest again when people can see success and be recognized for what they have done well and also know where to focus more. And I think the last, which is really evident in this event, is that at the end of the day, it is, it's the people. And from top to bottom of political and technical pyramids, we have colleagues who genuinely care about poverty or about empowerment of women, these focal issues in different contexts. And engaging them is, is key because their energies and insights, when they understand a tool like WEA or like a multidimensional poverty index, they can take our work to places we simply cannot go as academics or as qualquant measurement folks. And so really understanding and networking with these and giving them a platform to speak um, in places we could not um, in private sector or in head of state engagements is vital, again, to keep this issue before different populations. So it's really a salute to Wea. Um, thank you so much for this occasion and this time to remember together and think forward how to keep the momentum going for the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina, for highlighting those key uh, points uh, that, that make this tool such a success. We're now going to turn to Abhijit Chowdhury. Um, given how important Bangladesh is, you've already had a sneak preview of him in the video. Uh, he's, he's the integrator um, for resource mobilization, partnerships and communications at the Professional Assistance for Development Action Group, Pradhan. Um, Abhijit, I have two questions for you. Um, you've been a partner in developing the ProWEA. Um, were there any surprises in the findings from your project? And secondly, what have you learned that changed or that might change the way you design and implement projects in Bangladesh? Thanks very much. Over to you, Abhijit. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, many congratulations to IFPRI and all who have been involved in developing the the way yeah coming and <clears throat> thank you for this questions uh coming to the first question uh were there any surprises so just to give you some context and as agnes says context is important so we had this <clears throat> program called wings which was uh, basically uh, layering nutrition on self-help groups which we were promoting and this was with uh, 
in eight locations in deep central India tribal uh, dominated areas. <clears throat> so frankly speaking, we were a bit surprised that the evaluation did not show much, you know, evidence on the impact of SHGs on nutritional outcomes. So, uh, and especially on the pathways to impact. So that was very surprising for us. But I think, uh, so the, though the shift in the, on the needle of, you know, nutrition outcomes was not there, but what the evaluation picked up for us was that there was a lot of change in, when you look at the pathways otherwise. For example, on the agricultural pathway, there was a lot of positive change in the food security, in in growing kitchen gardens, in uh, consumption of <clears throat> fruits and vegetables production side, and in consumption of flesh food, uh, flesh foods and and eggs. But overall, also it was very you know kind of surprising for us to note that uh, the disempowerment both in women and in men was very high in these areas. And by the end of the project in five years, there was significant 25% increase in women's empowerment and around 20% for men. And even the gender parity index also, there was significant uh, improvement. So I think we were a bit taken aback that, you know, there were such positive things along the act pathway or the income pathway, but it did not translate into nutritional gains for the women or the children. So I think that is what it taught us that, you know, that uh, even with well-functioning SHGs, uh, nutrition outcomes or changing the needle on nutrition outcomes is, is quite a long and complex matter because uh, there are intergenerational issues, there are other very deep seated issues, and this takes a lot of time to move. So, I think that is <clears throat> something that we have kind of taken from this experience of the pro -air. And, you know, coming to the, uh, the next question of what have you learned or what uh, will change the way you design programs? Sorry, I went on. So as an organization, I think we we have kind of stepped back and started to look at, uh, you know, what, what is happening in our programs, especially our ACT programs. Because, you know, we work mostly with women. We work with 1 million women. So we are, of course, reaching women. We understand that. But then the question is, are we really benefiting the women or not? And if you're empowering women or not? So I think these were some of the questions which were posed uh, to us and we was we started to look at you know what are the pathways which lead to bit, um, women's empowerment and which leads to you know, better outcomes whether in nutrition or income or economic empowerment so we started to look more deep dive into our programs and i think as a practitioner what was important for us is that the the index helped us to move from you know what is an abstraction because when you go to rural communities, when you go to uh, work with women, when you start discussing about women's empowerment or patriarchy, there needs to be some points on which you have to kind of anchor the discussion. So as a practitioner, the way are the domains, the five domains of empowerment, those give us some handle as to what are the issues that we need to touch upon. And that facilitated the communication with the communities. So they could also relate to what we were wanting to kind of, you know, put in front of them for, for discussion. And we being practitioners, we turn that into you know, nice flip charts, some discussion points. So that community starts relating to all those, you know, all those issues. And then they start to talk about you know, how those issues are impacting them. So I think it helped us start the conversations uh, in, a, in, a, in a format which communities could relate to. And you know, the shift that we have made is that we started to look at you know, what are the structural issues that are holding back women. So because we have an SSG program, SSG is the foundation of our work, but we soon realized, I think, that we have been realizing this also, that you know, just SSGs cannot you know, automatically to women's empowerment. So we have moved now from self-help groups to promoting commercial uh, economic collectives of women, which we call FPOs. Because we understand that you know, unless until women are actually controlling uh, the incomes that are coming from the farm are able to influence the uh, the, ch the crop choices are able to influence uh, you know the how the income is spent. This is not going to move. So in a way that pro the the pro experience has helped us to gradually shift our programs in a fashion where we are now actually looking at whether it is going to impact and empower women or not. So in a sense from just wishing that we were uh, hoping that we would empower women. I think we have 
a better handle on what to do so that women are actually empowered. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Abhijit, and let me apologize. I misspoke, of course. Uh, Pradhan is a very important partner of IFRIS in, in India, not, not Bangladesh, so apologies uh, for that. Uh, a reminder to the audience to submit, keep submitting questions. We've got lots coming in already. We'll get to them very soon. Um, we're now turning to Chiara Kovarik. She's a program officer with the Women's on Women's Empowerment Agricultural Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Chiara, it's great to have you with us. The, the foundation has invested in the development of the PROWEA. How are these metrics relevant to your work at the foundation? And a follow-up question, are other projects which the foundation is funding also using these metrics? Thanks very much, Chiara. Thank you, Charlotte. It's so nice to be here today to celebrate this milestone with IFPRI and all the other panelists. The PROWEA measures are very relevant to our work at the foundation. Women's empowerment is a priority that's integrated across all teams at the organization. And for the agricultural team in particular, women's empowerment is both a strategic goal and a fundamental accelerator to achieving some of the work on our other outcomes of interest, like improving diets and building resilient food systems. So it's really important that we're measuring how our investments in agriculture are impacting women's empowerment. ProA is a really effective tool for doing this for multiple reasons that have already been mentioned by the other panelists. First of all, it is multidimensional and really comprehensive. As Jim mentioned, WEA covers domains ranging from mobility to decision-making to time use. As both Agnes and Karen mentioned, it's collecting data from both men and women. And this is really important because it allows us to understand whether the constraints that we're seeing in a specific project area are gendered or whether they apply equally to both men and women, which really allows us to design our programs accordingly. And finally, as Agnes mentioned, both the quantitative data is collected alongside qualitative data, which really lends important nuance to any data point data points that we're looking at. The foundation has been sorting, has been supporting the ProWEA since 2015. And among other things, it's very much helping us to understand this complex concept of agency, which is central to empowerment, kind of regardless of sector. So I know that as we learn more about agency through the ProWEA work, this will be really valuable to our colleagues across the foundation as we're all trying to collectively design more programs that place women and girls at the center. And we're also very happy that we're not the only organization using WEA. We're just one amongst a broad coalition of partners. You saw the map that Agnes presented sharing the many, many users of WEA and pro WEA, which includes other donors, multiple implementers, research institutes, and country governments which allows us to have a common understanding of women's empowerment in agriculture and to have a community that can help to set a collective learning agenda around women's empowerment in agriculture. To your second question on whether projects that we fund are also using these metrics, absolutely, and many of them. And these projects run the gamut from those focused on livestock to crops, to income generation, to nutrition. For example, one of our grants in Bihar, India, focused on women goat rearers, collects WEA every year as part of their routine m and &E. And another program we support used pro WEA in an impact evaluation to assess women's empowerment in a program focused on the rice value chain in Burundi. You know, what we'll recommend for any given project really depends on the project scope, but we do recommend that all farmer facing grants use some form of WEA in their data collection. For programs that tend to be more gender transformative or those that really place women's empowerment at the center, we often will recommend pro WEA because it captures the most detail on empowerment. For programs that are more gender intentional or those that may reach and benefit women but might not necessarily focus on women's empowerment, we'll often suggest a WEA as well as the inclusion of any other modules that might be relevant for that program's theory of change. 
And we see a lot of benefits to recommending WEA so widely across a variety of programs. Not only are we learning more about how these programs are impacting women's empowerment in agriculture, we're also helping to build team capacity so that collecting women's empowerment data becomes commonplace and team members are able to analyze and leverage that data to make agricultural programs that are more impactful for women. And finally, as you've heard before, we also invest in an initiative called 50 by 2030, which is a partnership between the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Bank, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which is really intended to support countries that are trying to build stronger agricultural data systems. And as Agnes noted, we have a partnership with IFPRI to design a measure of women's empowerment called the WEMENS, which is really suited for these national statistical systems and draws on many of the learnings of the WEA. So we hope that in the future, countries are routinely collecting this data consistently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Um, it's great to be working with you on, on the way up. Um, our last speaker in this panel, last but not least, is Farzana Ramzan. She serves as the Senior Gender Advisor in the Inclusive Development Division at the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Um, Farzana, I have two questions for you as well. Uh, how useful has the WEA been for the programming that USAID undertakes? And what do you think are the new directions in the use of this empowerment uh, uh, tool uh, and, and metrics? Thank you, Charlotte. Um, first, as Karen and Agnes noted earlier, I want to extend our gratitude to Emily Hogue, one of the fairy godmothers of the WEA. Um, and to our partners at IFPRI, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, OFI, and the users of the WIA, who we learned so much from. The WIA has been incredibly useful in helping us to advance toward our collective goals. As Jim noted in his opening remarks, Feed the Future has been collecting WIA data for a decade, primarily through our population-based surveys, to monitor and to evaluate Feed the Future programs, to ensure our efforts are empowering women, advancing gender equity and equality, and supporting the essential roles that women and men play in reducing poverty and hunger. For example, WIA results in Ethiopia influenced the design of Feed the Future value chain activities and led to a greater focus on targeting areas of women's and men's disempowerment, such as in ag access to credit and in heavy workloads. In Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Honduras, Kenya, and Nigeria, WIA data was used to inform USAID's global food security strategy country plans. Feed the Future also partnered with governments and global and local organizations to use WIA data to advance women's empowerment where traditionally women face significant barriers to inclusion in the agriculture and food systems. As we heard earlier in 2012, WIA data showed that in areas where Feed the Future was working in Bangladesh, 75% of women were disempowered. This information moved the government of Bangladesh to design a national program on agriculture, nutrition, and gender, and one that responded to the specific constraints faced by women in agri-food systems. In 2015, nearly 14% more women were empowered, and by the end of the first phase of Feed the Future a few years later, women's empowerment in Bangladesh increased by 31% as measured by the abbreviated version of the WIA. With an eye to the future, the government of Bangladesh had also integrated the WIA in its national surveys, which Dr. Ahmed talked about in the video earlier on, to continue to track and respond to needs and constraints faced by rural women and men. The results of the WIA also informed the Ethiopian government's national nutrition program, which recognizes that lack of women's access and control over household resources, time, knowledge, and social support networks were barriers to improving outcomes. Efforts were made by the government to design and implement projects to increase women's engagement in and control over economic activities. However, as Jim shared in his remarks, since then, the world has changed. COVID-19 has exacerbated existing economic, health, and caregiving crises, affecting access to income and employment, savings and asset ownership, time use and care burden, and food and water security. Climate change compounds these risks to the health, safety, and economic security of women and girls worldwide. 
More recently, our Bureau invested in assessing the impact of COVID-19 on rural women and men, and we learned that women reported greater food and water insecurity compared to men. Using phone survey data in Kenya, we learned that empowered women, as measured by the abbreviated WIA, were less likely to report selling assets due to pandemic-related income loss compared to disempowered women. The WIA accelerated our ability to measure, track, target, and respond to these challenges that affect rural women and men worldwide in all their diversity. As far as new directions, the White House released the first ever national strategy on gender equity and equality to guide our work. Our national strategy highlights the importance of the analysis and dissemination of gender data and the importance of investing in strengthening national data systems. We will continue to support the development of the Women's Empowerment Metric for National Statistical Systems, or the Women's, as Agnes and Kiara discussed earlier, and promote the integration of metrics on paid and unpaid work, women's leadership, decision-making, and access to and ownership of resources into country-owned survey programs. We will build partnerships to increase the availability, access, and use of gender indicator data, such as the WIA and the Women's when it's developed, together with high quality sex and age disaggregated data to ultimately support the design and implementation of policies and programs that accelerate the pace of change in closing global gender, gender gaps in agri-food and water systems. Finally, we will continue to promote the collection and use of WIA-based metrics, such as the project level WIA, to monitor our own performance and track changes in women's empowerment and gender equity that occur as a direct or indirect result of Feed the Future programs globally. Thank you so much for your time and for your partnership, and we look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now moving into the, the Q&A, and I'm going to um, kick off many thanks to all of you for your questions. Keep them coming. Um, I'm going to ask the first question to Karen, and this comes actually from a colleague of yours at the World Bank, Talib Kilik, uh, with the Living Standards Measurement Study, who's asking um, that there appears to be significant untapped potential in the reuse of WEA data, which could further enrich the evidence base that speaks to the utility of the pool. How can we promote better data reuse? Karen, do you want to take a stab at that? Karen, we, can, we can't hear you if you're trying to speak. So sorry, I always forget the unmute <laughs> function. Uh, that's the word of the, of, of the decade right now, unmute. Um, I have to say this is an excellent uh, question. I do think there's a lot of untapped potential. But one of the things that I really think is also important is that we haven't done as much as we can uh, to go within the household and ask women and men about their own incomes, their own outcomes, their own um, control over important um, assets and so forth. Uh, we're trying to do that right now in the Living Standards of Measurement Study Survey. We have something called the LSMS Plus, which is piloting in six countries, uh, the uh, going within the household. I'm sorry, there's an echo on my line. Um, uh, just trying to get that off, uh, going within the household to ask men and women questions. Uh, and while we show that we have the technology to do it, it's not scaled in household surveys. I'd like to see in multi-purpose household surveys, always an intra-household module. And I think the WIA is so important to show us that it can be, uh, can be done. So uh, I think the next step for us, and I'm really excited about the women's, I didn't know it was pronounced that way, to think about how we can influence uh, statistical offices in their regularized surveys to be collecting this information. And I'm also very encouraged by the examples we heard of governments that are actually using this for programming. Uh, one of the issues, I think we have to show a business case uh, to be able to get the intra-household information. And it's very encouraging that in Bangladesh, uh, that case exists but I think we need to make sure we disseminate this elsewhere so that other governments can follow that model. Back to you. 
Thank you very much, Karen. Agnes, let me turn to you with a, a, a series of questions actually about the, the sort of evolution of the way and, and whether or not you're looking at some of these uh, uh, topics. So an anonymous questioner is wondering, given the extractive nature of the way of surveys, expense and time needed in running them, is IFPRI considering other tools that are more participatory? A second question also from an anonymous questioner is, um, speakers have referred to gender equality. Does WEA capture or intend to capture gender measures other than binary male, female, um, which uh, does not capture all gender identities? And then a last one in that uh, series um, from Jane Luiki Zuka, uh, who thanks everybody for the inspiring progress, and then is wondering whether um, the WEA can create pathways to filling data gaps on intersectionality including age, data, and youth focus. So that's a lot of questions, uh, um, uh, Agnes, but let me see if you can take a crack at those. Okay, thanks, thanks Charlotte, and thanks to everyone who, contri who contributed those questions. So um, uh, let me start with the first one about um, using participatory tools given the extractive nature of household surveys. Um, I, I mentioned during my presentation that WEA actually does have a series of qualitative protocols. Uh, the PROWEA has a series of qualitative protocols which were developed in tandem with a quantitative instrument. And the reason behind that really was because it's important to get the views of the women and men themselves about how they experience empowerment. So um, Ruth Meinsendick was very, much involved in the development of these protocols. So maybe Ruth, you might want to, to say more about this. Um, second question about why are we using uh, a binary measure of gender when we all know that, you know, there are other, it's not a binary concept. Um, part of it is practicality. Some of the countries where we work really operate on, there, there isn't, that much tolerance for a non-binary concept for, of gender. And so I think to address this and to interpret it contextually correctly, um, you need to do qualitative work and sort of need to nuance how you interpret these results. So again, you know, being sure that you're not constrained, you're not constrained by the quantitative data, that we're not having those blinders. We have to, you know, be open to other things, use other methods to get at this, to unpack these other concepts. And finally, um, can you can ProWay or WEA create pathways to fill data gaps on intersectionality? And the answer here actually comes from the fact that the WEA and ProWay are embedded in other household surveys, are embedded in surveys where we collect information on other things like caste, ethnicity, um, levels of poverty. So if you want to look at intersectionality, you cannot depend on WEA or PROWEA alone. You have to embed it within a survey and ask about those other aspects of inequality, which are very important. So I think I'll stop here and maybe um, Ruth can chime in on the qualitative tools. Ruth, would you like to come in? Sure, just very briefly, uh, beyond the qualitative tools, I like the point about participatory tools. and. Um, I have a dream at some point of being able to do this as, as a tool on a smartphone that groups like Self-Employed Women's Association in India or Pradhan, uh, our partners, could use and have groups themselves assess and say, where are our biggest areas of disempowerment? So I would like to see even more participatory applications of this. But over to uh, you for more questions. Great. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Abhijit, you're very close to the ground uh, there at, at Pradhan. So let me direct two questions to you. One comes from Luis Rico Aranibar from Bolivia. How can, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad question. How can we achieve greater empowerment of rural women, especially indigenous women in decisions on agriculture and climate change resilience issues? You get a minute to answer that big question. <laughs> and then the second question is from Arun Katri Chetri, who's an agriculture and environmental economist. It seems that there are many project level impacts. Are there any countries formally using this tool for policy guidance or program design and implementation? Over to you. Uh, 
yeah unmute is the word <laughs> yeah so i think yeah uh, the second question i'm not very sure of but i think on the first question uh, from our experience what we can say is this that it is a long down process and for us as i think i have said in my uh, when i was speaking is that we start with the collective of women i think and i think that is the platform which is very important to bring women together because from our understanding in the in the kind of context that uh, we operate uh, you cannot empower a single individual woman you have to have some methodology of some process where women are able to support each other so i think what is important is that you are able to trigger a process where women can actually work together support each other and take on different kinds of roles which would be traditional in the main domain so for example in an agricultural program where the <clears throat> and what you see in india is that you know the men have moved out of the villages so there's a lot of migration so women are left behind to look at agriculture so there's a lot of feminization of agriculture in india happening but you see women are disadvantaged because they don't have the tools the know how the technology so i think what pradhan does is you know you, we start working on these aspects of you know access knowledge technology and put the women at the center stage of a program and when you have that collective of a, a self help group or a producer group and then mobilize that into a larger federation or a farmer producer organization i think that ecosystem is what is important to support women to move ahead and uh, you know on the empowerment index so i don't know one minute great uh, thank you i was just kidding because it was such a complex question um let me see if maybe kiara would like to answer the question about uh, how this uh, the the way i has helped shape policies is that something you might want to look at yeah sure i'm happy to jump in on that charlotte thank you i think that there's um a lot of examples that we're starting to see of countries really seeing value in wea um and wanting to collect it at a national level so for example this past year in 2021 at the un food system summit the president of ghana announced an ambitious target around increasing the wea score by 20% across ghana which is really wonderful to see um and also we're seeing other countries expressing interest in the 50 by 2030 initiative and the potential women's measure there so i think we have a lot of opportunities for countries to um collectively measure this um there's also the cat up framework which includes a indicator of women's empowerment in agriculture and is kind of a motivating um and incentivizing instrument for countries to continue to collect this data great thank you uh, thank you very much uh, sabina let me ask you uh, turn to you with this question again an anonymous an anonymous questioner are the are the pro way tools truly sensitive enough to capture changes in empowerment over the life of a three year research project um, and obviously somebody from ifpri may want to join in uh, on that one as well what are we learning about this Thank you so much, and I would welcome um, insights from folks at IFPRI as well. But what we find in terms of, for example, a separate index, a multidimensional poverty index, which has a global specification and specifications in dozens of countries at, for national indicators, is that a number of countries update every single year. Um, Mexico, uh, sorry, Colombia, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Vietnam, uh, South Africa, and others update every two years. And often there are visible and statistically significant changes because you're not just looking at one indicator, but you're looking at a nexus of indicators of women's empowerment and particularly projects that should be linked to the particular project which is being assessed. And so because of that, I think it's an important tool, but it can show change um, with standard indicators within three years. But over to uh, Agnes. So I, I admit I called for a lifeline for, for, for this and I asked um, our index team, Greg Seymour and Hazel Malapit for input on this. So, so Greg says for the question of impacts, um, ProWea shows strong impacts and is more sensitive to changes in empowerment than the previous versions of WEA. So this is based on impact evaluations for six projects in Africa and South Asia. Um, 
And Ruth might want to say, um, has Ruth also sent me a message saying it's not only the question of sensitivity of where the changes, but also about how long it takes to empower. So because the index is an aggregate index, sometimes some components of it are going to move faster than others. And typically the components that move faster are the ones which are being targeted by the particular intervention. So I think if you wanna track um, changes, look at the component indicators, it will take longer for the aggregate indicator to move, but we have seen movement within the timeline of a 1.5 year project. Great, thank you. Um, let me pose a question to Ramzan and Kiara uh, as, as both important donors uh, and funders of the, um, of the WEA. If donors think that having a women's empowerment data is important to project success, do you believe that they're also willing to fund the investments in data collection, training, uh, and other uh, measures to support this? Sure, I'll go ahead and, and respond. Um, we are at, through our partners at IFPRI and um, together with Kiara and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we are absolutely supporting um, data collection efforts into country owned survey programs along with our government partners. Our, one of our primary vehicles, um, as Kiara mentioned earlier, is through our partnership um, with the 50 by 2030 initiative to close the agricultural data gap. Um, we've also worked very closely and, and supported um, LSMS, the Living Standards Measure Measurement Surveys, integrated surveys on agriculture that uh, Karen mentioned earlier and that Talib had also asked about in some of our countries. Um, and for capacity building, we really, through our partners, work together with national statistics offices um, to build the capacity in country to be able to design, collect, analyze, report and use data um, to inform their policies and programs um, in agri-food systems and more broadly. Um, and then more recently, um, I don't want to steal Ruth's thunder, but I know she'll be talking about uh, uh, some of the distance learning modules that IFPRI has developed to also support um, broader uptake of uh, the suite of WIA-based metrics that are now out. Um, uh, I'll hand it over to Kiara to add on. Thanks, Farzana. And as Farzana noted, we're also investing in building the capacities around national level data collection and use of, of sex disaggregated and women's empowerment data. I think another important thing to note is that as we recommend the pro WEA and, and similar measures for inclusion within our grants, we're also hoping to build the capacities amongst the, the team members of those grants. You know, for some of them, they've been working on women's empowerment for a long time. Their ME teams are very skilled in this. They've been collecting this sort of data and it's common practice. And for others, this is something new and that's really exciting to be able to push the boundaries and increase the capacity of these teams to begin to collect women's empowerment data for the first time and to allow them to see value in that and continue wanting to continue to collect that. And so we ensure that within our grants, when we recommend the use of WEA or pro WEA, we're also building in the resources necessary for those teams to be able to collect and use that data. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Prasanna and Kara. Um, I'm going to go to Yo Swinnen, if he's uh, still with us, uh, for the final question. And if not, Agnes and Ruth can jump in. It's a really important question. What can uh, the one CGIR do across its project portfolio with all its partners to make WEA and women's standard practice where appropriate and feasible? Hi, um, Charlotte. The well, I think we are in, in the, the one CGR and the new investment portfolio that we're putting together. There are uh, really two main areas where um, uh, gender plays a very important role. One is in the gender platform, which is uh, it's already existing right now, but it will continue and, uh, and be extended in the new um, one CGR structure. And then there are also initiatives which are focused explicitly on gender research uh, for example, the Her Plus initiative, and I think also there, there should be a link with, with what is going on and, and support the type of work that's going on. But I'm sure that Agnes and, and Ruth can also add to that because they've been involved in, in several of these things. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, very quickly, um, we actually have an existing grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through the Gender Platform to help to um, scale up the use of WEA and nutrition metrics um, throughout the CG. So this is ongoing work which is being done 
um, by the methods module, which is being co-led by Hazel Malapit and Elizabeth Bryan. So you can ask them. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Well, thank you to all of our questioners for great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, let me now turn to Ruth Meinsen Dick for her closing remarks. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much. This has been a really rich discussion. Um, to close the session and then launch the next decade of work using WEA metrics, I want to start with some thanks. USAID and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been more than supporters, they've been instigators, really encouraging us to be ambitious, helping encourage the uptake of WEA metrics, and including the co-organizing of this session. Now, when I say the organizations, the organizations are deliver through people, and uh, there have been quite a few individuals probably too many to name or risk missing some, but thank you, Farzana and Chiara, who are, are here today and many others. Um, EFAD, uh, GIZ, and Millennium Challenge Corporation and Walmart Foundation ha have also provided financial support and uh, encouragement to us for expanding the applications as have the CGIR research programs, A for NH and uh, policies, institutions and markets. At IFPRI, we have had a superb team working on this for more than a decade. And I just wanna thank you all uh, who are with us today and those who have moved on to other uh, places. Um, this has been an incredible experience of partnerships. OFI was a partner in developing the original WEA. We've had 13 partner organizations implementing projects uh, that partnered with us in piloting pro WEA, along with a lot of universities and a really stellar advise, external advisory committee. Uh, pro WEA especially would not exist without the projects. And uh, World Bank, LSMS, and Emory University in um, the developing the women's. And on the next slide, um, I want to thank all of you for attending our WEA anniversary party. If this were an in-person party, we would be handing out goodie bags or mementos. Since we can't do that, we've prepared some virtual goodies. Um, they're all available on our WEA Resource Center, which is wea.ifpri.info. Um, but I'd especially like to draw your attention to the distance learning course. I'm particularly pleased to announce, drum roll please, that we have just launched the French edition of our Foundations module with Arabic and Spanish to come yet as well as the English that's been available and uh, used by hundreds of people already. Um, to answer the questions that we get about which variation of WEA should I use, we have a new online tool from the Resource Center. And uh, the graphic of it is there, but there's you can go through and answer the questions yourself and get recommend, recommendations. We look forward to including many more of you in our growing way of family. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Ruth, uh, for the virtual goodies. And thank you for everybody uh, who has participated in this meeting, both the speakers, the audience, for everything that you do to uh, uh, promote women's empowerment in, in agriculture and in food systems. Um, let me also thank very much the, the IFPRI event management team and USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for co-hosting this event with us. Be sure to join us tomorrow, um, Thursday, for a 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, policy seminar on sustainable land use, the role of soil for a sustainable food system. This is a food and agriculture transatlantic dialogue co-organized by IFPRI and the Embassy of Germany. 
Have a great rest of the day, uh, wherever you are. And many thanks again. And congratulations on all of you who had uh, a hand in the, in the development and ongoing evolution of, of WEA. <laughs>